and we are back talking about improving game design a uh, uh, a discussion thread uh, that you can find on the miniatures page under the game design uh, section uh, of the message board okay uh, this is um, something McLaddy wrote I wanted to skip it because I didn't think that it really was I didn't think it was good for uh, this this type of uh, commentary but what happens afterwards <laughs> means means that I'm gonna show it so McLaddy says Tony you spoke of deeper games and and I haven't been able to elaborate on my uh, my reaction to this concept of depth in, in in games I'm not saying depth is not there um, I actually think that there are meaningful uh, uses uh, for the term depth. I just think that um, it's actually used in so many different ways that it becomes nearly meaningless. Um, but anyways, that's another discussion. Uh, McLaddy writes, I follow Lewis's blog and mentions uh, his notion of deeper games. Just FYI, as an interesting uh, view of current wargaming, he's just retired. There's a link. Lewis Pulsifer. Lewis Pulsifer, commercial game designer, author, game design instructor. Okay, some more, some more uh, links, I guess. Okay, and then one part of the blog, fewer significant decisions. McLaddy includes this uh, long uh, excerpt. Um, uh, what, what can we say? Uh, um, Well, all right. Let me let me let me clear. Let me really quickly hit some highlights from this excerpt because it kind of sets up McLaddy's uh, point, and you'll see the response, a response to it. Um, fundamental experiences people want in games have changed. Okay, people are much more interested in variety than gameplay depth. That's interesting. That the, the claim that people are much more interested in variety than in gameplay depth. Interesting. Um, they want a lot of uh, choices, but they don't like many difficult, significant choices. Interesting idea. Uh, all right, so go on. Um, <clears throat> tend to rely more on intuition than logic. Okay. Um, uh, players want to be rewarded for participation. They don't want to have to earn their rewards by making good decisions. Interesting idea. Um, hobby wargaming often involves studying the games. People don't study games much anymore, especially casual gamers. Okay. All right. Um, okay, and then he says, uh, the writer of this post, this pulsifer, I know people who have played Britannia more than 500 times, but nowadays you're going to find few newly published games that anyone will ever play 500 times, especially not one as long as Britannia. Interesting idea. I think war games are still going to behave for people who want old-fashioned gameplay depth as opposed to simple variety. But if you want want to reach a larger market, you need to recognize that the number of significant decisions has to be reduced. And then this writer, Pulsifer, mentions a young lady, um, exceptionally intelligent and focused, but uh, she basically um, she likes tactical video games where you have just a few characters to control. Okay, interesting observation. Uh, okay, R response, auto at home. So what Pulsifer is saying is that war gamers are infantile, stupid, lazy, and have a huge sense of entitlement and the attention span of hamsters. I don't know any uh, miniature war gamer. Okay, so first of all, that first part is clearly, right off the bat, whatever auto at home is trying to say, their mark comes off as clearly... Uh, extreme, uh, over the top, um, probably a setup for something, right? Just red flags go up all, you know, all over the place. Okay. Why, why, you know, loaded words, infantile, stupid, lazy sense of entitlement. That's a, that's a possibly a coded phrase. Uh, and the attention span of hamsters, clearly, uh, a derisive, clearly a derisive way to start a comment. 
Okay, I don't know any more miniature wargamers like that. Of course, that's a completely useless statement because who was saying, or I'm sorry, Pulsifer wasn't saying that wargamers are like that. So the fact that you don't know any like that, completely irrelevant. Maybe he means uh, the people who buy his games, which I don't know, whatever. Remember what's popular is by definition inferior. Okay. Uh, uh, McLaddy responds. Uh, really? That is the takeaway from his descriptions. Uh, yeah, I. <laughs> McLaddy is perfectly uh, reasonable to ask. Is that what you took from that quoted material? Um, and then remember what's popular is by definition inferior. Auto at home said, so McLaddy responds, I didn't know that. Yeah, whatever. When the only evaluation of a game design is some feeling, a subjective personal preference, any description of a particular game design or a particular gaming bias is going to be seen as a personal attack by somebody. That also means any discussion about improving game design is, is the suggestion that someone's personal preferences aren't good enough or wrong. And this is where, if nothing else, we need to separate out so that we can talk about game design and war games in a constructive, uh, reasonable way without it being intermeshed with people's decisions about how they spend their time, which too many people, I guess, uh, have that link, link, have that hardwired into their sense of self, uh, I guess, to the degree that all sorts of personal feelings and emotional reactions are triggered, I guess. In, all, in any case, not a good situation, not a good situation for constructive dialogue. Um, <laughs> I think that's pretty much what McLaddy is uh, concluding. Uh, Garth in the part, responding to... Uh, McLaddy saying, really, that is the takeaway from his descriptions. Garth in the park says, yeah, basically, if I had a loony for every time I read some crusty old war gamer and gnashing his teeth about the kids today, and how they don't have any attention span and need instant gratification, and it's all the fault of schools and video games, are probably, at this point, like Auto at Home, I can pretty much say Garth in the park is setting up again, um, setting up False premise, setting up a, yeah, false premise, um, or at least an unsubstantiated premise. Um, so I'll skip that first, the rest of that first paragraph. He says, Garth in the Park says, I'm old enough to remember when the cutting edge of game design was a typo ridden 200 page monstrosity full of flowcharts and tables and uber serious injunctions from the designer. This is what I thought. I knew, I knew it was in here. I mentioned this before. I knew we were going to get to super hyperbole about these so-called ancient war games that were these big, what have come to be seen today as these types of you know, boogeymen. Um, uh, so show me this typo-ridden, 200-page monstrosity full of flowcharts and tables and uber-serious injunctions. I'd really like to see it. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying that, again, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'd like to see this. I'm not throwing out the challenge of, I want to see this uh, because I'm saying that don't exist. Maybe they exist. Maybe they don't. Still haven't ran into them. My point is that even if they do exist, they're being made into this boogeyman today in too often in our discussions here when... I'm not sure what they relate to in the real world. They're boogeyman. All right. All right. I'm going to look again. I said before, I'm going to look into this, you know, where are these head, head numbing, where are these mind numbing rule sets from the seventies and eighties? Yeah. It'll be interesting. It'll be an interesting, uh, adventure. Count me among those who think that games are a lot better now than they used to be. The writing is better, really, with better editing, really. More illustrated examples to make things clearer and designers have forced themselves to make cleaner, simpler designs that don't require a week and a slide rule to work out, really. 
A week is, is really taxing, huh? Hmm. I don't want to go back to the good old days. My eyesight, patience, and leisure time aren't up to it. I just, I just, I'm going to return to this. This is, this is not meant to be a, a quick swipe at all. I want to return to this because, you know, I am a young gamer and I'm not looking for instant gratification. I'm looking for game rules that take weeks and weeks to figure out. My eyesight is fine. My patience is extensive. And my leisure time, well, I don't have a lot of leisure time, but I'm prepared to give all of my what little leisure time I have to this hobby. So, hmm, that's that. Um, anyways, that that also is for another time because I want to put that in the, in proper context. Um, what am I getting at there? That is not meant to be a quick swipe. Um, in passing, was not meant to be that. What I'm referring to is, I think there are some false dichotomies set up between, you know, older gamers and younger gamers. I think that there are some, some cliches that uh, groups older gamers I think are being painted with broad brush um, uh, cliches, and I think quote unquote younger gamers are being painted with some broad brush. Uh, 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 you know what I'm getting at? Some broad brush. Um, in broad brush terms as well. Uh, okay, so the, the referring to the, again, I knew the Britannia game came up again. So quote, referring back to the players who played Britannia 500 times and Garth in the Park. Yes, Garth in the Park says, that is supposed to be some sort of virtue that we've lost. Again, I don't remember... I don't, you know, I don't remember in that quoted material any reference to virtue. Again, this is this is over making your argument, and I'm going to point this out. I mean, I've missed it. I could have pointed out many more times, and I've plain, plainly missed pointing them out so far. But I will continue to point out: you're making your argument. You're over making your argument. Uh, the post doesn't say anything about a virtue of playing the game that much. You made, you introduced the concept of virtue. Um, and you introduced the virtue for a reason, because you're setting up your counter-argument. Uh, that you stubbornly, play, and here it is, that you stubbornly play the same thing over and over and never try anything new. Hmm. Um, I think you're, you know, I'm not sure who you're, arguing with, because that's not related to the quoted material before. Um, and it's funny, because if you look at the original um, quoted material there, he's really just saying, you don't have games that are played a lot. You don't have individual games that are played a lot. One could imply that that's commentary on gamers today, it's just as likely that you could say there are so many games available to play that, cor that, that, that correspondingly you don't have one game that's played so much. I don't know. Possibly. Possibly. Auto at Home comes back, dear McLaddy. Uh, so yeah, and McLaddy just double, double da doubles down here. That means they're lazy. No. Not true. That means they're stupid and can't think. No, not right. That means they're unmotivated and have an enormous sense of entitlement. No. Now, now you, you, not only did you double down, you added enormous sense of entitlement. Um, hmm. And the attention span of hamsters. Yeah. Uh, this reader is a little Um. Yeah. Basically, he doubles down. Yes, that's exactly what I meant, even though, well, even though the most reasonable person could say he went way overboard with his characterization of what he read. Yeah. Um, Wolf Hag, uh, I think overall people are looking for instant gratification when they want to be entertained. Okay. Um... I read video game designers stating that 
yeah, that you need to get a player involved in a in the fun part of the game right away. Point, shoot, and blow things up. Interesting point. Uh, miniature gaming involves dropping fifty to two hundred dollars to get started, plus the investment time, painting for you, and put them all on the table. But that is what entertains most miniatures players. It seems to be just as much or more about the visual creativity than the game itself. Nothing wrong with that. If you're going to be a financial success, do what it takes and forget your critics. If you if you can build an immersive environment where people can have fun, earn rewards, or better yet, purchase them, then just keep them entertained. It's a game, and games are all about being entertained. Entertain the mass as you make some money. Entertain, entertain groups with a narrow interest and go broke. Game designers may want to take a page out of WOT. Now that, I'm assuming, is World of Tanks. Um, I'm no fan, but they're a successful, profitable company. Okay, he goes on to talk about that. Um, the historical accuracy of World of Tanks. It's popular. Um, okay, I feel the hobby is in a continual WIP. Hmm. And any, I'm not sure what WIP is. And uh, what is WIP? Don't know. And any new game design rule or mechanic is a step in the right direction. Good ones will survive. Most will die a slow death. I too feel today the production value, graphics, rules, and overall presentation are much better than 20 years ago. Some of the games that take the most heat for not being realistic or historical are doing the most to bring in new and younger players into historical miniatures. Okay. We should not criticize players for playing them or we may chase them away. Yeah, that's... We should all remember that. I, I can... Yeah, can't, can't argue with that. Right now, you can choose to play an easy dice game, roll sixes to your heart's content. Um, uh, there seems to be something for everyone. Okay, yeah. Weasel. The annual the, This is interesting. The annual reminder that a game can be a simulation without being complicated. Yes. A game can be fun while being complicated. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I guess, I guess I've kind of given away my bias towards that idea already. A crap game with a fun group is still pretty good. Absolutely. I mean, I just say that from experience. A crap game with a fun group is still pretty good. <laughs> Absolutely. Proven by experience, yes. Most people don't play exclusively realistic or unrealistic games. All play Command Decision and 40k in the same day. I know, I mean, I know that from my own experience as well. Uh, not those two. I will play, I will play Tactical Combat Series and I will play, um, and I will play, hmm, I will play, um, and I will play Command and Colors Ancients. Yeah. Most gamers are pretty insular and don't really have any interest in the industry at large. Okay. The industry is so small that whoever goes and does something gets to shape it. Absolutely. Agree with that sentiment as well. What you consider easy can be hard for someone else. My stoner, I love this. My stoner friend gets ASL but gets tripped up playing Crossfire. That's that's a classic there. That's a good <laughs> that's a good quip. I've seen kids calculate their D&D character's attack bonus 30 levels in advance, and old men forget which dice to roll in Crossfire. That's also that's also a pretty good quip. Yeah. McLaddy comes back. Um, so when Garth talks about, oh yeah, oh yeah, my, uh, my favorite, the typo-ridden 200-page monstrosity. Uh, McLaddy writes, Garth, I agree. I'm glad those days are gone. That approach did the hobby no good in the long run. We are still feeling the effects. Well, I'll tell you, to McLaddy and Garth, I think while, while I don't dispute your claim from your experience, um, and I mean, I'll go ahead and assume you got it right. I'll tell you that from this one war game, one younger war gamers foxhole, um, I think we can start going the, in the other direction. I don't think the damage was permanent. That's all I got to say. <laughs> uh, count me among those who think the games are a lot better now than they used to be, etc. Um, McLaddy responds, I understand completely and tend to agree. However, how is that a different view than what says different view than what says about the general population. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. Back to the Britannia 500 times. 
Uh, oh yeah, and then and then the that's supposed to be some sort of virtue. Yeah, and then McLaddy very reasonably says, I don't think he was presenting that as a virtue at all, but a basic difference. Yeah, in your comment, I already mentioned that. And your comment seems to support his observation in changing or at least current gaming preferences. Okay, if true, that is just fine by me. Lewis Pulsifer may be an old cur curmudgeon longing for the good old days, but I don't think you can assume that from his blog, assume that from his blog, unless you imbue his observations with like, dislike opinions about how it should be in the mental failure of the present generation. Again, bottom line, there isn't there isn't no reason for, let's say, the present generation, quote unquote, to feel denigration from the commentary of so-called old curmudgeon wargamers. It's the bottom line. Um, McLaddy. Um, okay, so now he's referring to Auto at Home. When Auto at Home is double down, uh, is doubling down, that means they are lazy. Auto at Home. Auto. Wow, that is some mean reading between the lines. Yeah particularly when Lewis describes those games. Okay, on and on. That McLaddy is going to come back. Well, that's really, well, you're doubling down and wow. So if the gamer doesn't like that kind of game, they're automatically considered stupid. Okay. Um, isn't it possible that Lewis can state what he sees as new preferences, new preference in games without judging in such personal and derogatory ways? Clearly, Auto at Home is ready to ascribe... Um, really mean, vindictive motivations on the part of the original Pulsifer, um, which is, well, it, that is what it is. Uh, so, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, McLaddy's going to respond and try to lay it out. Some pretty interesting things he has to say when he's laying it out, but really he's, he's just uh, trying to break it down his opinions on how he interprets Pulsifer. Yeah. So you lay it all side by side and see what you think. Um, basically he's saying auto at home, to put it charitably, just makes some huge leaps in interpreting what he read. Um, uh, okay. Um, Okay, Bill Owen writes, uh, why are the games fun? Why are the games fun? Is it only the challenge and recognition of historical elements or are there more aspects of the fun? Misspelling of there. A few mentioned the extra investment in painting a miniature army. For many, that is where a lot of the fun is. I, I imagine so. Um, better be, it takes so long, yeah. The research both of what to buy and how to paint it costs Techniques, expertise mean that many war gamers may start and sometimes end up as modelers. I imagine so. Learning history, or at least militaria, is part of the process. A reasonable observation. At age 12, I remember the paradigm shift from painting one-off model planes and having the idea of painting a unit of three B-25 bombers and still without any rules. But since we were familiar with Avalon Hill war games, we struggled to figure out how to fight battles with models. I, I have similar childhood experiences until Leon Tucker's fast rules came along and then tactics. The latter moved us up from being above average to the rarefied pinnacle of elite gamers overnight. No more dirt clods from the roof of the house, which we call Greek artillery or beep. I, I like this story. BB guns at 50 yards with binoculars to watch the fall of the shot. Excellent. I love it. Remember the postcard that came with each uh, Avalon Hill game. Do a bright friend a favor. If you know someone who has the basic brain power to comprehend Avalon Hill games, they would send them a catalog. So here Avalon Hill was prospecting for new business, but a big part of the appeal was to reinforce your wargamer proof of high intelligence. Now, while I wouldn't use these words, this does kind of re refer back to what I said before about when I first was handed these games way back at age 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, I mean, I, per I very quickly picked up 
that these were games that you learned, that you studied, you learned, and you enjoyed that. Um, now, I never attributed any of this high intelligence or whatever. No, if anything, I was more, I was thinking more in terms of uh, putting time in, time, effort. Um, you're not going to understand a war game like with, with, with just what comes out of the box in general. Um, to really understand it, you're going to go to the library, you're going to we'll go online these days, you're, you're going you're gonna to research, you're going to try to learn more. Uh, that's all what I'm referring to. I'm not, I, not even going towards this whole thing of you know, high intelligence and blah, blah, blah. I'm sure it was a good way to sell their games back then. Might be a good way to sell games now. I don't know. Anyways, some games, I'm just babbling now. Some games have a similar call to action to the brilliant, okay, or at least well-read, but a bit more subtle insofar as the claim to realism is an invitation to the reader to verify his own vast knowledge. Perhaps sneer at yokel gamers. It is indeed a different time. <clears throat> but when I was growing up, it seemed that I would go to Vietnam. Oh, my junior high school gym teacher said that was his goal, to prepare us after generations who had to go to war, perhaps playing war games. We might be learning some survival skills. It's a cinch that most of us city kids had little shooting skills. The war had become more technological. I don't understand the young folks' choice of subjects, and that may be a feature for them. Uh, not a bug. Games might appeal to the grandiose Walter Mitty. Can you do better than Napoleon or as well? One way war games can have more depth and less of a one-off game's last turn scramble is to play campaigns of linked battles. Okay. Uh, finally, it's a sad fact that some war gamers may find it almost as much fun to e-talk about war games more than they get to play them. Okay. And there we go. Um... End of the discussion thread. So <clears throat> this has, well, first of all, this was uh, four times longer than I expected it to be. Um, and I even tried to move quickly through the discussion. Um, what I wanted to do is kind of lay down some, some foundational ideas, perspectives. Uh, I think I've done that. Um, uh, a lot more to be said, a lot more to be developed. Um, I think probably most importantly, I laid down my general, my general vector is uh, to see wargaming um, uh, complemented with a more disciplined uh, approach um, that allows us to talk better about our games, compare games without it always devolving, and I'm not suggesting that it always devolves to this, but to avoid the, the eventuality that our discussions always devolve to, uh, you know, sweeping claims of it's all about taste, to sweeping claims about, you know, it's all about historical accuracy or, or what have you. Um, and, and yeah, and I laid down some other things. Um, deep a depth. Again, I believe there is a meaningful thing. Uh, I believe that we can isolate a meaningful concept of game depth, but I don't think we're there. I haven't found it. What I see, instead, what I see is lots of different squishy concepts of depth. Um, <clears throat> feel. Feel is one that really uh, uh, captures my attention whenever I see it. What do we mean by feel? Um, it's really important. If you, if you are, uh, and I know, I know, smart, incredibly experienced War gamers who believe that feel is kind of one of those uh, central um, elements of the wargaming experience, and that's and that's fine. But what I'm saying again is I haven't found an articulate person to lay out uh, a meaningful and useful concept of feel. Um, 
and I come from a skeptical, you know, uh, vantage point, a skeptical, uh, I start, I start with skepticism because I don't see feel anywhere. Okay. I don't feel it. I don't finish, uh, by the way, I probably should pay attention. <laughs> probably should pay attention to my own videos. Maybe, maybe I do do this, but I don't think I do. I don't come away from a game going, you know, rating a game's feel. Uh, it, the whole concept seems alien to me. Um, of course, I could just be missing a real fundamental thing uh, that I should be paying attention to. But as it stands now, I don't see feel at all, and so I don't understand this uh, this element. Um, and for very smart, incredibly experienced, long-time war gamers to be comparing feel between games is, I just find it really interesting. Um, uh, I definitely, you know, for the first time, I do believe this is the first time on record that I've come out saying that... Um, there again, there, there, there is a. It's real. There is a widespread, generational, collective feeling. And there's that word again. Uh, about wargaming uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, I wasn't wargaming then, so it doesn't really mean anything to me. But um, what I find funny is that. I'm still looking for these monstrosities, these typo-riddled 200-page monstrosities. Um, now, if those games are simply bad games, which is why I haven't found them, hey, a bad game is a bad game. It doesn't matter whether it's a 200-page typo-ridden monstrosity. A bad game is a bad game. So I can uh, bypass those games because they're bad games. But again, I, I'm starting to think that this is more of a, a boogeyman that is um, in, in, in widespread circulation today because this boogeyman uh, is a good stand-in, I think, for maybe some widespread um, you know, sentiments of, of war gamers of a particular generation um, or multiple generations. I don't know. Um, interesting, not sure, a lot more investigation, you know, needed there. Um, um, yeah, I think that's all. So this, uh, you know, my commentary, my commentary, monologue on war gaming, many different aspects of war gaming, focusing on war game design, and of course, using this uh, discussion thread from TMP as a handrail. And, uh, Need to clean up the you know presentation and execution, but uh, otherwise, um, I think I'll return to this uh, format.